All right, we're doing the book of Job, Faithful Living in Times of uh, Crisis. This is lesson number six in that series, title of this lesson, The Theological Crisis, part three. And uh, we'll be covering uh, chapters 22 all the way to chapter 37. So kind of a long stretch that we'll be doing uh, tonight. Well, so far Job and his three friends have uh, more or less debated to a draw with no progress made by uh, either side. The, uh, the friends have held fast to the conventional wisdom of the day that uh, the sinners are punished for their sins and uh, this wisdom explains the reason for all the calamities that uh, have been suffered by Job. Job has lost everything in life, uh, his health, his wealth, his family, so on and so forth, and, uh, but clings to the idea that he is an innocent man, a righteous man, and uh, he is being uh, punished uh, unfairly. His three friends come and as we have seen, each in turn have tried to convince him that the reason that he's uh, suffered all these things is because he has sinned in some way and if he would just uh, repent, uh, everything would, uh, would be fine. Of course, Job for his part, he agrees with them in principle, like Job agrees with them that uh, uh, sinners are punished. Uh, this is a truism and he's in agreement with that, but he holds to the idea that he himself is an innocent man and he doesn't understand why he is being uh, punished. Uh, he not only knows uh, that uh, this, uh, this uh, traditional wisdom is true, but he also argues that God knows this as well. And his, his theological crisis is uh, God knows uh, that sinners are punished. God knows that I'm not a sinner, that I'm an innocent man, so why am I being, uh, why, why am I being punished? So that's his, that's his crisis, that's what we're dealing with uh, here. So this uh, theological crisis has caused him to reevaluate the accepted wisdom of that day, and he begins to formulate an explanation that makes sense of the seemingly conflicting facts that are facing him, that a just and loving God would actually punish uh, an innocent man. So this new formulation he puts forth in his final speech in response to Zophar uh, back in chapter 21. So Job's uh, conclusion is that, um, uh, rather his conclusion is a wisdom that says in part that sometimes the innocent suffer and the wicked go free, but one day God will judge both according to their actions and his wisdom, not man's wisdom. So we see here uh, a flash of insight is uh, quickly set aside by Job's friends who immediately renew their attack using the same line of argument that they have used from the beginning. So Job, you know, he's, he's uh, because he's the one suffering, he's the one who is motivated to come to a, a new idea, uh, to come to a, a new conclusion that'll try to explain uh, what is uh, taking place. His friends, on the other hand, stick with the uh, traditional wisdom. So the friends continue with a condemnation of Job and in particular, the sins that they believe that he is guilty of. So we go to Eliphaz, uh, again, who uh, begins the third cycle of speeches, chapter 22, and we'll just read the first uh, section of his speech. He says, uh, then Eliphaz the Temanite responded, can a vigorous man be of use to God or a wise man be useful to himself? Is there any pleasure to the Almighty if you are righteous or profit if you make your ways perfect? Is it because of your reverence that he reproves you, that he enters into judgment against you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? So Eliphaz claims that God does not need man, even if he is righteous. However, an evil man does get his attention. Imagine that. He's saying, you know what, just because you're righteous uh, doesn't mean anything to God. You're not adding anything to God's pleasure. You're not doing a favor to God because you're a righteous man. He doesn't care about that. But if you're a wicked man, oh, God will pay attention to that. This is, this is Eliphaz uh, thinking. And this is quite a cynical view of God who is unimpressed uh, by a man's righteousness, but only concerned with a man's wickedness. Imagine if that was uh, what God is like, and this is what uh, Eliphaz is proposing here. 
Eliphaz reveals his lack of knowledge concerning the true and living God and his character devoid of love and, and made up only of justice and retribution. This is the God that Eliphaz is describing here. Now Eliphaz moves on from this basic view to list Job's many sins of which he has no proof. He has no proof of these sins, but he concludes that Job must be guilty of the following in verses six to 20, guilty of injustice, guilty of rejection of the poor, the hungry, the widowed, indifference to the presence and the judgment of God, in other words, disbelief of God, and general arrogance in rejecting God and not being afraid of his judgment. And then he completes his speech by exhorting Job to repent while there is still time. Just read that last verse. Yield now, he says, and be at peace with him, thereby good will come uh, to you. So Eliphaz's appeal is that if Job repents, uh, God will be at peace with him and will repeal all the bad things that have happened uh, to Job. His thinking is simple. Acknowledge and repent of your sins and God will bless you. This process, of course, is true in general, uh, but it's not true in Job's case. And, and he will say as much uh, in his reply. Of course it's true, if you're guilty of sin and you repent, you will uh, come to uh, peace uh, with God. Uh, that is true, uh, but it isn't true in Job's case, because uh, as we know, Job is uh, innocent of uh, sins against God. So we go to Job's reply now to Eliphaz in chapter 23. Job renews his search for God's presence and what he would do should he come before God to plead his case in chapter 23 verses one to nine. Despite his search, however, Job confesses that he cannot be found. You know, I'm looking for you, God, and if I found you, I'd plead my case, but he, you know, he can't find God. Even so, Job reasserts his innocence. Even if he cannot find God to plead his case in person, Job maintains his innocence nevertheless. Job even contends that God not only ignores his righteousness, but is also oblivious to the evil taking place in the world and provides an example to prove his point. And we'll read that in chapter 24. Um, uh, verse, uh, verse 12, he says, from the city men groan and the souls of the wounded cry out, yet God does not pay attention uh, to folly. And then in uh, chapter 24 repeats the same uh, idea in verses 18 to 25. And so much like Solomon, Job says that uh, good and bad people do what they're going to do and then in a moment they're gone and eventually they're forgotten. In other words, all is vanity, and, and, and if it's not, who's to say differently? So we hear in this section, we hear uh, uh, echoes of, of Solomon in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, looking at life, saying, uh, you know, a, a, a rich man uh, lives well all his life, uh, and a poor man lives poorly and difficultly all of his life, and both of them die, and they go into the ground, and eventually they're forgotten. And, and, and Job says pretty much the same thing in this section here uh, to demonstrate his, uh, uh, his despair, if you wish. He's beginning uh, to be discouraged. Again, he still believes that God is there, uh, but now he's uh, starting to uh, think that God doesn't care either way. Uh, whether you do good or, or evil, uh, God doesn't care. Um, so Job's reply is, is quite cynical as well. Uh, still maintaining his innocence, but expressing the thought that even if this is so, perhaps God doesn't really care one way or another. The conclusion of a man who still believes, but whose belief is uh, warped uh, by his pain and his uh, suffering. And so uh, we move on to the second speech, and this would be a Bildad's speech, uh, chapter 25, verses uh, one to six. Uh, only two of the original three friends uh, speak in this third cycle of uh, speeches, both uh, Eliphaz and Bildad. Zophar, the third speaker, the most dogmatic and intolerant of the three, is uh, uh, quiet after the second cycle of speeches, uh, and his place will be taken by Elihu, uh, the youngest of the men uh, present, uh, including Job. Uh, so Bildad's short speech, only six verses, 
uh, will focus mainly on man's inferiority uh, to God. Uh, he has no new arguments to present to explain Job's uh, situation. So he falls back on the obvious observation that man is inferior to God and how can he even think that he can know the mind of God? You know, all this business of what does God think and what is God doing? You know, uh, Bildad is saying, what's the point of that? We can't know what God is thinking. So all of that is, is, is futile. His argument is, that, uh, is the argument of the agnostic. We can't possibly know. And since we are so inferior to God, why should we even try? And so uh, this is what Job is attempting to do, right? He's trying to know God's mind. And Bildad is saying, yeah, you can't do that. That's impossible. Why, why even try doing that? It's futile. Uh, so we read in uh, 25, one to six, Bildad. It says, then Bildad the Shuhite answered, dominion and awe belong to him who establishes peace in his heights. Is there any number to his troops? And upon whom does his light not rise? How then can a man be just with God? Or how can he be clean who is born of woman? If even the moon has no brightness and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man, that maggot, and the son of man, uh, that worm? And so his final response is that God is so far beyond man in both power and purity, how can man think to challenge him or even claim to be pure. In other words, to be righteous or acceptable to him. And this is of course uh, what Job is saying. He's innocent, he's, he's right before God, all right? And of course, uh, this is you know, what Bildad is saying is true. Uh, without Christ, we know, without Christ, man can't be righteous before God. Uh, prophet Isaiah says that our righteousness uh, is like filthy rags uh, before God. So again, Bildad, you know, without knowing it, is saying something that is true. And uh, you know, as time goes by in our situation, uh, in our era uh, with the gospel, we uh, quite understand this idea that no man is righteous uh, before God. And so the next section in chapter 26 is uh, Job's reply to uh, Bildad, uh, chapter 26, one to 14. And his reply to Bildad is uh, broken down into two sections. Uh, first of all, he mocks him. He mocks uh, Bildad's weak response of falling into agnosticism, you know, the idea that you, you can't know. So let's read uh, uh, verses, uh, chapter 26, one to four. Then Job responded, what a help you are to the weak. How you have saved the arm without strength. What counsel you have given to one without wisdom. What helpful insight you have abundantly provided. To whom have you uttered words and whose spirit was expressed through you. And so he summarizes Bildad's position as being useless, also providing no answer or help for those seeking answers uh, and having no inspired source. Uh, then uh, Job uh, provides a more exalted vision of the living God. You know, uh, all that Bildad can do is say, you know, we don't know, we're worms, we're less than uh, perfect for sure. So there's no point in trying to know, uh, trying to know God. And so uh, Job kind of uh, you know, uh, responds to this by giving some notion of how great God is. And he provides, a, a, as I say, a more exalted vision of the living God. First, uh, from the spiritual perspective, from the spiritual world that we cannot see, he says this, the departed spirits tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Naked is Sheol before him, and Abaddon has no covering. And so God is the God of, this, uh, of the spiritual world. Uh, the spirits tremble before God. So he, he, Job you know, uh, 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 suggests God's um, uh, sovereignty over the spiritual world. And then he talks about the created world. He says, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds and the, clouds, uh, and the cloud does not burst uh, under them. So now he talks about the created world that we do see and that we dwell in and we see the, 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 uh, the, uh, the greatness of God in these uh, things. And so like Bildad, Job acknowledges God's greatness, but he does so with a sense of reverence and respect. God is greater than man, of course, 
but not simply stronger in measurable ways, he is greater in ways that only God's, God could be. Uh, we read again in verse, um, uh, in verse uh, seven, he says, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. I mean, you know, as far as mechanical strength is concerned, no, no man, the strongest man in the world would not be capable of doing this particular feat here. Only God has this ability. And so Job you know, praises God uh, by demonstrating some of the things that he can do that we can see that only he can do and that no man could ever, um, could ever accomplish. And then we have Job's final words to his friends in chapter uh, 27. Um, Zophar uh, does not speak after Job replies to Bildad. It would normally be Zophar's turn to speak, but Zophar doesn't speak. And so Job takes the opportunity to speak to the three friends together who have come to spend time with him after he has suffered great loss of family and wealth and of course his health. He no longer responds to each of them in turn, but actually speaks to them as a group. And so he begins by affirming his innocence. Despite all of their arguments, he holds fast to the one thing he knows to be true, as well as God. God knows this as well. And that is that he's an innocent man. He's being punished for something he didn't do. He summarizes his position by saying, first of all, no matter what God does to me, I will not sin, just as I have not done so in the past. So we read that, verses one to four. He says, then Job continued his discord and said, as God lives, who has taken away my right and the Almighty who has embittered my soul, for as long as life is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils, my lips certainly will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue mutter uh, deceit. So no matter what God does to me, uh, I, I will not sin uh, purposefully. Second, he says, I will never admit that you and your arguments are correct. In verse five, he says, far be it from me that I should declare you right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. And then the third thing he says is, my conscience is clear. In verse six, he says, I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach any of my days. Then the next thing he does is he describes the mental condition and material ruin of the wicked. Some scholars believe this is Zophar's response to Job's declaration of innocence. However, it is mainly seen as Job's way of assuring his friends that he is well aware of how God deals with the wicked. You know, they're always saying to him, you know, God punishes the wicked, so therefore you must be wicked. And they're thinking and assuming that uh, you know, he doesn't believe that, but he does believe that God punishes the wicked. In other words, just because he holds on to his innocence, it doesn't mean that he is not aware of how God deals with the guilty. Then, another thing he says to them, uh, he praises God's wisdom. Uh, Job continues his speech uh, with a praise to godly wisdom with his point being that man cannot answer the ultimate questions for this kind of wisdom is the prerogative of, of God. This may be his own conclusion to the dilemma that he is facing. In other words, does God punish the innocent? That's the question he's struggling with. And the answer, well, some questions only God has the wisdom to answer. And so his friends who thought that they were wise could not answer his question. And so Job declares that only God has true wisdom, which is the understanding of how all things work together. So we read a small passage here, verses 12 to 15. Job says, but where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. So wisdom about the creation is not found within the creation. And then in verses 23 to 28, he says the following, God understands its way and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and also searched it out. 
And to man he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. In other words, only God possesses this wisdom. And, and a man who is wise is a man who fears God and understands that God is the only one who has the wisdom for the creation and the wisdom to understand what takes place with all men in creation. So what is understood here but left unsaid is that God knows the mystery of Job's life and will reveal it because man cannot reveal it. And man, not just man in general, but you know, in, 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 in reference to his friends, these three guys over here, these three individuals, they don't have the wisdom to answer the question, why is an innocent man uh, suffering? So, in a sense, this is Job's final argument uh, to his friends. And the final argument to his friends is, God will reveal the truth concerning my suffering and my innocence one day. And of course, this is true, right? We, you know, the, the truth of it is revealed. We, uh, we are the ones who get to see the answer to that uh, mystery as we read uh, the book of Job. So in uh, chapter 29 to 31, Job uh, uh, makes a summary of the situation. Uh, he has maintained his innocence and he has demonstrated that he is quite aware of the sufferings brought upon the guilty by God. He has praised God's unique wisdom and suggested that perhaps only God's wisdom will be able to make sense of his dilemma, you know, an innocent man being punished by God, since neither he nor his friends have found a satisfactory answer. In this final section, Job will complete his speech with the following remarks. First, He's going to review his happy past filled with great power and wealth and righteousness. This highlights the position from which he has fallen. You know, he go, a highlight reel, you know, a highlight reel from his past. This is who I was. This is the height from which I fell. This is the good life that I had before my troubles came. Then he describes his present wretched condition, having lost family and wealth and influence and respect, his wife, his health, uh, you know, chapter 30, verses one to 31. This is done to indicate his utter loss of all things precious in his life. And then thirdly, he mounts one final challenge to God uh, to accuse him of sin in chapters 31, one to 40. Job uh, does ask for his health um, uh, or wealth back, uh, excuse me, he doesn't ask uh, for his health or his wealth back, but rather he seeks to clear his name of a false charge. In this, he demonstrates that being considered righteous is more important to him than physical comfort or position or wealth. And this request demonstrates the kind of man in the end that he uh, truly is. And that is the end of Job's speech to his friends. The next section is the speech of Elihu in chapters 32 uh, to uh, 37. A little bit about Elihu here. At the end of Job's final speech, a new character is introduced. Uh, he was the youngest in the group and at a time where there was great respect shown to the elderly, Elihu uh, refrained from speaking until Job and his three friends had ceased to speak and he didn't speak before he was sure that there, were, there was no more coming from these men. Though he is the last to speak, Elihu has a lot to say with his comments going on for six chapters. So he, when he does speak, he, he does so longer than any of the other characters. His speeches, however, attack two basic errors that Job has made in his arguments. One, that God is unjust in some way, and two, that God can't or won't uh, speak to Job. Remember, Job was always arguing that, you know, why won't God talk to me? Uh, and so Elihu chastises him uh, for claiming that God refused to speak to him. So these two ideas are contained in five separate points that Elihu delivers in one single speech. So very briefly, we're going to cover these five points. First, uh, Elihu expresses his frustration with Job and his friends for not coming to a satisfactory conclusion concerning their uh, disagreement. 
Uh, he's angry that uh, the friends failed to convict Job and he claims that even though he is young, he believes God will enable him to succeed where they failed. Uh, and so he, he, he wants to uh, uh, take his turn, if you wish. So we read briefly in verses 18 to 22, for I am full of words, the spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins it is about to burst. Let me speak that I may get relief. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one, nor flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon uh, take me away. Uh, so he's anxious to speak. That's the first thing he wants to let them know. He will answer the question. Number two, he explains that sometimes God uses suffering to turn men from their error. Well, there, there's wisdom there, of course, we know that, that's true. So there, there's a truism. Uh, it's not true in, in Job's case, but, it, but, but it's true in, in general. Uh, and we read about that in chapter 33. Uh, as I say, this is a true insight and it is wise spiritually, but Elihu has no way of knowing this to be true in Job's case. Not all true spiritual laws or approaches apply to everybody every time. So, uh, this was true in general, you know, that God uses pain to get your attention, but it was not true for Job, and it wasn't the reason for his pain. Third thing, he says, he defends God's justice, chapter 34. One of Job's points to his friends uh, was that as an innocent person, God's treatment of him was not justified, was unjust. If God punishes the guilty and rewards the righteous, then why is a righteous man being made to suffer? That was you know, Job's argument. Job was innocent of moral failure, but he was guilty of theological ignorance. Elihu merely repeats the argument of Job's friends. You know, God cannot be unjust, so Job must have done something wrong and he is paying the price. Elihu, however, doubles down on his argument by accusing Job of knowing his sin, but denying it. We read about that, chapter 34. It says, Job ought to be tried to the limit because he answers like wicked men, for he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words uh, against God. So in the end, Elihu was also guilty of theological ignorance and made his guilt worse by absolute confidence in his theological knowledge. You know, he, he was a kind of a know-it-all. I know he's guilty. And not only is he guilty, but he's arrogant in his guilt. You know, he, he, kinda, he kinda doubles down here. Fourth thing uh, that Elihu uh, does is he condemns Job's self-righteousness, chapter 35. He contends that by holding on to his position, you know, that he is, he is innocent and yet being punished for nothing. Job is claiming a greater righteousness than even God. If Job is innocent and God is punishing him unjustly, then the fault lies with God and not Job, making Job's righteousness even greater than God's righteousness. This is Elihu's argument here. We read that chapter 35. It says, then Elihu continued and said, do you think this is according to justice? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit will I have more than if I had sinned? So if Job is innocent and God is punishing him unjustly, as I say, the fault lies with God. The point Elihu makes for Job, uh, for Job is that Job's argument is that whether he sins or not, he's punished. Uh, in other words, it's a no-win situation. He's saying, this is Job's argument. I'm in a no-win situation. If I don't sin, I'm punished. If I do sin, I'm punished. I can't win either way. And so Elihu answers this straw man argument by claiming that it doesn't matter what Job does, good or bad, neither affects God who is too far above man. In other words, God does what he wants regardless of what man says or does. Job's arguments and demands and self-righteous claims are meaningless before God. And then finally, Elihu talks about how God deals with man in chapters 36 and 37. 
In the end, Elihu holds out hope because he enumerates the various ways that God's providential care is always available to man. Again, we'll read a, a section here uh, of uh, Elihu's speech. He says, behold, God is mighty, but does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives justice to the afflicted. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he has seated them forever and they are uh, exalted. And if they are bound in fetters and are caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they have magnified themselves. He opens their ear to instruction and commands that they return from evil. If they hear and serve him, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not hear, they shall perish by the sword and they will die without knowledge. And so Elihu repeats what the others have said about God, that he is generous, that he is just and forgiving to those who search and, and heed his commands, but he readily punishes those who refuse to hear and obey. One last uh, word from Elihu. He says, listen to this, O Job, stand and consider the wonders of God. Do you know how God establishes them and makes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know about the layers of the thick clouds, the wonders of one perfect in knowledge? And so these final words of Elihu uh, uh, create a bridge for what God is going to say to Job about himself and his power in the next chapters. You kind of hear an echo of what God is uh, uh, going to say to Job uh, when we get to that section. And so with the close of Elihu's speech, we come to uh, an end of the cycle of speeches from Job's uh, friends. So, the, so, and so ends the theological crisis portion of uh, Job's uh, book. Uh, the next character to appear, uh, to take the spotlight, will be the Lord himself, who will question Job's knowledge and his wisdom, and he will bring Job into a spiritual crisis. And so in order to prepare for that reading and that lesson, I want you to read Job 38, all the way to 42, uh, verse 17, uh, in order to uh, prepare uh, for our study of uh, the uh, third uh, crisis that Job uh, enters into, and that'll be the spiritual crisis. Okay, that's it for this time. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, we'll pick it up next time with the, uh, the Job's uh, spiritual crisis. <laughs>